I'd like to speak about color in Greek and Roman ancient bronzes. Thirty Roman bronzes are among the works which were selected to be lent to the High Museum in order to illustrate the topics of the nowadays exhibitions in Atlanta. Most of them come from Pompeii and Herculaneum. They were discovered during the 18th century, then restored and gathered in the Herculaneum's museum, which was inaugurated in 1758 in an annex to the royal residence built at Portici for Charles of Bourbon, King of Naples and of Sicily. These bronzes were admired, along with other discoveries, by fascinated visitors who came from all over Europe to see them, such as Goethe and Winkelmann. The excavations in Pompeii and Herculaneum had actually aroused through Europe a new interest for antiquities, works of art or daily life objects as well. It was a privilege given by the king to visit the museum. Few selected visitors were allowed to approach the antiquities on display and their impressions quoted in the diaries some of them wrote after their journey are of the greatest interest to trace the new concern with antiquity that emerged during the second half of the 18th century. By the peace treaty signed in 1801 between the French Republic and Ferdinand IV, the son of Charles of Bourbon, the new king of Naples and of Sicily accepted to give to the prime consul and his wife Josephine a selection of antiquities from Herculaneum and Pompeii taken from the collections of the Portici Museum. These antiquities were kept in the castle of Malmaison until Josephine's death in 1814. They were purchased by different collectors before entering the Louvre as they, being, as they were being bought by King Charles X in 1825 and by Napoleon III in 1865. They are of different types, different dimensions and functions. They illustrate how bronze, an alloy of copper and tin mostly, was present throughout antiquity. There were bronze statues and statuettes which were kept in sanctuaries or which adorned houses, gardens, baths. There were daily life bronze items used by the Romans who owned them, pieces of furniture, cooking or precious banquet vessels, weapons, armors, jewels, utensils of any kind. And since the Josephine's bronzes are on display nearby in the High Museum, meaning that you may have seen them already or that you might see them again, I thought it could be interesting to stress the fact that at the time they were manufactured for religious, artistic, or daily life purposes, they looked and they were intended to look different. In other words, what a Roman saw when he watched a bronze was not what we see today, even if we have the same bronze under the eyes. The colors of ancient bronzes are not the original ones anymore, meaning that we don't see the intended accomplished color anymore. Firstly, because of the passage of time, of the centuries they spent in the sea or buried in the earth. The bronzes excavated in Pompeii and Herculaneum were buried around 17 centuries in volcanic ashes, centuries during which a natural patina, that is of corrosion products, developed. And secondly, because of the conservation practices during the 18th century. Bronzes were cleaned and often chemically repatinated with a greenish black color 
described as Herculaneum in the sale catalogues of that time that advertised reproductions of these. So first of all, you have a photograph of what you can see in the Josephine's exhibition. Let's see some of examples more precisely. So maybe you remember this folding tripod, which was found in Herculaneum. We know that Romans used that type of folding tripod for various purposes in temples and at home. This kind of tripod could support a simple tray, a brazier for use in temple sacrifices, or for heating a room, a basin containing water for washing or wine for libations during religious ceremonies. The tripod shown shows the Herculaneum's modern patina, the dark polished surface of greenish black. And you can see how they were, this object was worked and the decoration with the panth panther's head. Another example, which was in Josephine's collection, is this very strange plate. We think a plate for eggs, found at Pompeii in 1799, 95, excuse me. This plate has 17 semicircular cavities. According to ancient sources, this type of plate was a cooking utensil for making refined dishes which contain eggs as, made, as main ingredients. It seemed that when the conservators looked upon it and restored it, that this plate was less touched by the 18th century conservators and kept more of its corrosion products, but even though you can see the color it has now, which is very greenish. A third example to, see you, to show you how different the objects kept in the Portici than the Josephine's collection were this lampstand with plant-like stem, which was found in Pompeii and it is shown supporting a volute lamp, the handle of which is ending in a leaf ornament, a type of lamp very widespread throughout the Roman Empire. Its surface shows once again the greenish black modern color. So fortunately, few ancient bronzes have retained their original color and give us a tremendous clue to try to imagine how those were. And one of the best example is that one. So you can see at first sight how different this bronze looks. This is the Derveny Crater which was found in the 60s of the 20th century around Thessaloniki and now kept in the archaeological museum of Thessaloniki, a spectacular vessel around one meter high. And uh, this really is one of the most impressive metallic vase that have survived to the present day. You see that uh, it is from the middle of the fourth century BC. It was found in a very rich tomb and used as a cinerary urn. It will be published this year by an American scholar from New York, Beryl Barshara, with very important photographs and a new approach for the style and the technique. As you can see, this vase seems to have been gilded, but it is not. The composition of the alloy is clearly and definitely that of a bronze. 
without any gold in the alloy. The vase is simply made of a copper alloy with a high percentage of tin, 15%, which is very high. Most bronze has, have only 10% of tin. So when you look at this vase, you can discover that ancient bronzes where, which were polished were shining and glittering like gold. They were alike yellow gold or red gold according to the more or less important amount of tin in the alloy. For instance, a 10 tin copper alloy was more red in color than a 15 person tin alloy as that one. And another thing we can discover looking at that example is that a decor could be added which was often inlaid in another metal such as silver or copper. And for instance, look at these tendrils. They are made of silver. So you can see the way the colors are acting. And if you keep in mind such a very wonderful piece, now we can turn back to the Josephine's bronze. For instance, this lampstand with lamps hanging on it, which was found in Herculaneum in 1746. The rectangular base plate is inlaid with a copper and silver design of branches enclosing five petal palmets. And I have some details showing you this pattern. So we have to remember that when manufactured, this lampstand showed another color. The red copper and the white silver inlaid motif was not enhanced by a dark greenish brown, but by a yellowish one. The same kind of contrast was intended for the gladiator, gladiatorial armors and weapons, such as, as you can see in the exhibition, you have different armors, a shoulder guard, a Trashian helmet, four greaves. So if we see details of the Trashian gladiator's helmet, which was discovered at Pompeii in 1767 in a place where gladiators trained, rested, and where their weapons were kept, called the Ludus Gladiatorius, the gladiatorial barracks, we can see that they were different color. You can see the detail above the front. Here you have a Medusa head retaining some of its silver sheet. The Tracian wore a helmet with large brim and a high crest, such as that one. The closed visor was made of several pieces which could be opened and removed. At the end of the first century AD, the visor was entirely covered with grating. You can see here that the grating is only for half part of it, which explains that it is from the third quarter of the first century AD. Of course, you know that all these bronzes kept in the Josephine's collections and now on display here are, were made before 79, time of the Vesuvius eruption. So you can see that this frontal part of the helmet above the rim is adorned with the silvered Medusa's head. So remember that 
The helmet was yellow in color and had only a motif, white motif, made of silver. Another example is this shoulder guard called a galerus, discovered the same year at Pompeii in 1767. In the same place, the gladiatorial barracks. It is adorned that time with two silvered ornaments. You see the medallion with the Hercules head, bust, let's say, and this silver crescent. The shoulder guard is that of a retiarius. Very few are preserved. This is a very rare example. The others are in the Naples Museum, Archaeological Museum. And I show you this painting by the painter, the French painter Jérôme, called Police Verso, meaning thumbs down, where you can see gladiators fighting. And if you look, and it's interesting because this uh, painting is, which was painted in 1872, is now kept in the Phoenix Art Museum. And if you look precisely at the weapons and the armors, such as the, not the helmet, the helmet of a, of a different type, but look at this here. You have a retiarius which is down, which is going to be murdered by the other one, and he is protected by a shoulder guard here, and if you look very precisely, this is this shoulder guard now in the High Museum, because um, this shoulder guard was part of the collection of Count Portales, who was one who bought bronzes after Josephine's death. And Count Portales had a private hotel in uh, Paris where he kept his collection. And the painter Jérôme could see, approach the, the armors, the weapons of the gladiators which were found in Pompeii, so he could use them in his painting. Count Portales uh, died in uh, 1855, and among his last wills, he said that he wanted his collection to be kept 10 more years in his private hotel. And then the collection was sold in 1865, and this is at the time Napoleon III bought part of it and that this object could come back to the Louvre Museum. And what is interesting when you look at this painting is that the painter Jérôme gave faithful color reproduction of the helmet and the shoulder guard. He knew pretty well that the bronze had not the same aspect that what he could see in the Portales collection. So you can see that they are shining and they are yellow in color. So we have an idea about the color of utensils, vessels, but what about statues and statuettes? Let us turn to the second exhibition held in the High Museum, the Louvre and the Ancient World where one of the most precious Roman bronzes from the Louvre is on display. This is it. Maybe you don't recognize it because it is very small and it is not like that. It is a small statue, but very important one. And this small bronze, you have the dimension eight, one to four inches high which, as a true masterpiece, can be extremely widened on a screen, was in the French collection, the French royal collections, before 1684. It is one of the bron bronze de la couronne, the crown's bronzes, three of which were on display last year in the High Museum's exhibition, Kings as Collectors. 
we know that the statuette was on display in the private apartments of Louis XIV in Versailles. This statuette is that of a Mercury who presented a purse in the right hand, a money bag, and the caduceus in the left one. Two little wings were attached in his hair. The attributes have disappeared, maybe because they were made of precious metal and were wrenched off during antiquity. This Roman statuette from the second quarter of the first century AD is an adaptation of a large-scale bronze statue created by the sculptor Polycletus before the middle of the fifth century BC, an athlete holding a discus in the left hand, so-called a discophorus. They are other, so here you have the details showing the for instance, the left hand, you can imagine that the caduceus was wrenched off from the hand. So, there are other Roman copies of this large-scale bronze from the 5th century. Marble ones, such as the sculpture from the Torlonia collection in Rome. So you see that the it's a little bit different. The Roman artist here had changed the behavior and in, in order to put other attributes in the hands, but it's exactly the same type, echoing the same original, which was holding a discus. Polycletus was concerned with the stance and the symmetria, the precise mathematical proportions of the parts of a statue to another. The weight is borne on the right leg. The right hip thrust outwards and the right shoulder drops. The left free leg is slightly advanced. The left shoulder is turned up. But this stance is not yet the one that Polycletus experimented around or just after the middle of the 5th century BC that is shown by the Doriphorus, the spare bearer. You see that it's not exa exactly the same balance. This is the Doriphorus, one of the most famous Roman marble copy kept in the Vatican. Here, when you look at the discophorus, the two feet are resting on the ground. With the doriferous, the left foot's heel is lifted. The discophorus could be a polycletus work referred to by Pliny the Elder during the first century as the nudus talo incessens, which means na the naked man walking on his heel. So a work created before the new stance embodied by the, the Doriphorus. This small statuette is very unique among the Discophorus Roman replicas, for it is made of bronze, and as it is echoing a large-scale bronze sculpture, it is technically closer to the missing original. And despite its small height, the eyes are inlaid with silver, the lips and the nipples with copper. If you approach the statuette in the gallery, you'll see that. And indeed, we know from few Greek and Roman bronze original statues which have survived that in order to achieve a very realistic effect, some features were accentuated by different metals. The lips, the nipples, and occasionally the eyebrows were inlaid with red copper. The teeth and occasionally the fingernails were inlaid with silver. Garments 
headbands or crowns may receive inlays as well. The eyes were inserted from the outside. The white were of bone or ivory, the irises of glass paste, the pupils of stone or glass paste. A rim of metal or stone might separate the white and the iris, or even the iris and the pupil. The whole of the eye was encased in sheet bronze, the, the edges of which were cut to resemble lashes. So we have some of these bronze which survived to us, very few of them, such as the Delphi charioteer. You can see, because the eyes are still preserved, that they are sheathed in copper alloy sheet, that they retain their brownish glass paste for the irises. The eyebrows, the lips, are inlaid with copper. The meander which adorn the hairband is inlaid with silver and even the teeth are covered with silver. When you look at this picture, you can tell that the teeth are inlaid with silver, but look at this other detail showing, because the mouth is slightly open, so you can see the silver teeth and the parted copper inlaid lips. And you can see how the sheets were cut to resemble lashes. Another great example from the fifth century too are the Riace bronzes discovered off the coast of Calabria, southern Italy in 1972. They rest their weight on the right foot with the left leg slightly advanced to balance the body. And here is the statue A, around 460 BC, the time Polycletus thought and maybe manufactured the discoverers. You can see that this statue has copper nipples, parted copper lips, and silver teeth. Bronze lashes surround ivory corners. The irises are missing, unfortunately, but they were made of glass paste. And there is a detail which is really impressive. This is it. When you look at the mouth, you see the silver teeth, you see the red copper lips, but look at this detail. You can see that this red copper lip, the red copper upper lip, is hidden by the bronze mustache. So we can understand, looking at such a bronze, how impressive was the mastery of bronze workers, artists working bronze at that time before the, in the fifth century BC. So now when they were discovered, scholars had to understand how this was made possible. And the conservator, now the specialist, Italian specialist of bronzes, Edilberto Formelli, who studied the Riace bronzes in the 70s and beginning of the 80s, traced the process back. And his hypotheses are now widely accepted. He knew that there were some, oh, excuse me, some examples of isolated lips, copper lips, found in Olympia. And look here, there is a hook on the mouth. So it is a little bit difficult, but we know that bronzes were cast with the lost wax process. Master, mold, master molds were taken from an original clay model of the head, 
which must, must have been a very rough one, lacking both the hair and beard. The master molds were then lined with wax, which was filled with a clay core. After the core had dried, the master molds were removed and the finishing details were worked in the wax. So here you have the stage with the wax head lined with the core, clay cord. So this is wax. But before adding in wax the mustache and the beard, the sculptor, sculptor removed the mouth, cast it separately in copper, having put this hook here so that he could reinsert the copper lips in the wax head. And then the wax mustache and the beard, which were to be cast with the head, were then added. So luckily, because of these small details we can have from Olympia excavations or Delphi excavation, we can understand how large-scale bronze sculptures were manufactured. For instance, we have eyelids telling about this technique of sheets with cutting edges. Eyelids from Olympia on the left and a big eyelid from the Athenian Acropolis on the right. And you can see how the edges were cut. We have isolated eyes witnessing the high quality and the preciousness of these elements. Irises could be green, violet, blue, brown. These are eyes from Olympia on the left. And if you look at this iris and pupil, the pupil is made of obsidian encircled by a gold rim and a glass-faced green iris encircled by a rim of stone. And you can see with this section that there was a gap between the stone and glass paste iris and pupils only to help the, color, the light to play through and to give the idea that the eyes were alive. On the right, it, you can see the pair of eyes purchased by the Met Metropolitan Museum of Art in 1991. These uh, eyes were once inlaid in a statue about, about twice life size. They are made of marble, frit, quartz, and obsidian, and are encased in shit bronze. Scholars have studied such eyes and discovered that to make one eye, you need one week. And it was a specialty in Roman time. There were workers who made eyes, only eyes. Another very famous example who can help us understanding what was the color of bronzes is this head kept in the British Museum, London, from the Sudan, from Meroe. And we know it was manufactured just before 25 BC. So you can see the detail of one eye. The white is made of marble. The iris is encircled by a bronze rim and is composed of several green glass paste compartments. You can see them here. The darker glass paste pupil is encircled by a bronze rim as well. And you can see from another detail that the inner corner of the eyes were made of a reddish glass paste.
here is a view from the inside of the head to show what was the structure of the eyes and how we know they were inserted from the outside. Another example of the color, different colors, this is a, a head found on the Athenian Acropolis called the Acropolis Youth around 470 BC. Here, the hair bound, excuse me, the The hair bones, the eyebrows, the lips are copper inlays. And one eye only is preserved. Another example, this is the crest of a bronze statue's helmet from Delphi. The bronze is adorned with a copper inlaid meander. Another example, it is a part of a statue. It is um, the lens of a, a weapon of a statue. And unfortunately, I had only a black and white photo, but you can see that these details here, inlaid in copper, are intended to, to evoke blood, as if the weapon had wounded someone. And here, it is black and white too, but it's a finger now in Princeton, which was discovered on the Athenian Acropolis, and it retains a fingernail, which is very unusual, but which existed. This is a technical choice which was described by Posanias when he visited the Athenian Acropolis during the second century AD. He mentioned as very unusual a helmeted bronze statue from the fifth century BC made by an artist named Cleotos. And he wrote, there is a helmeted man by Cleotos and Cleotos made him the fingernails with silver. A last example showing you these colors witnessed by these spectacular bronzes which have by chance survived to the present days. This is a seated bronze boxer kept in Rome and which was found in the substructure of a Roman building on the Quirinal in 1885. The eyes are missing. The Lips are inlaid with copper, but you can see that he is injured. Look at this cut on the cheek, others on the nose, on the eyebrows. So these cuts are inlaid. This is inlaid copper blood dripping from the wounds he had suffered in competition. And as he turned, he has turned his head suddenly. He has inlaid copper blood on the right shoulder as well, and the right arm as well, coming from the cuts on his face. And scholars who studied it discovered that, excuse me, here there is a part which was inserted, a special piece made of another alloy only to show another wound with a different color. So now, can we have an idea of the real colors? Were they different from the utensils, the items which we saw at the beginning? You can see on the left the fragment of a calyx crater from Taranto from the 4th century BC showing Apollo seated outside of his temple and a statue of the god inside the temple. The seated god is rendered as if he, were, he was living but the god statue standing in the temple with partly open doors has golden flesh and hair. 
a white bow, a white bow, bow and cup as if they were added in silver and details checked in brown. So you can see here, to get, you can have an impression of what a big, a large-scale bronze statue looked like. And on the right, you have a modern reconstitution of a large-scale bronze statue, one, uh, the one which stood on the Athenian Acropolis and was created by Phidias around 460 BC, maybe the Panopius Apollo. So you have exactly the real color of the bronze, the large-scale bronzes which were everywhere in the sanctuaries, the public places, and later in the Roman villas. We have a, an ancient writer, Geo Chrysostom, around 40, 120 AD, who wrote that the skin of a famous living boxer named Iatrocles, who trained outside, had a color which was the same as that of a well-mixed bronze, and that the boxer looked like a carefully made statue. Copper and silver inlays on a yellowish or more reddish bronze, blue, brown, violet, or green glass paste for the eyes help creating realistic effects close to the human body. We know from ancient literary testimonia that bronzes which had this very yellow or red gold color after casting were appreciated when retaining their natural gleam. But in order to keep them as they originally were, they had to be cleaned very often. A third century inscription from Eastern Greece, actual Turkey, prescribed that a bronze statue of a tyrant slayer be kept free of corrosion and bright. Pliny the Elder, Cato or Posanias wrote that bronzes, in order to keep their gleam and color, had to be protected with olive oil or pitch against the effects of time and rust. But the problem encountered was that there were too many bronzes to be kept free of corrosion, and that oil or pitch had to be removed from the bronze surface when getting old and had to be spread again over the surface of the bronzes. So very quickly, if not cleaned and protected with new oil or pitch, bronzes that stood in the open air oxidized and turned reddish in color and later were covered with a green layer of copper carbonate because of the carbon dioxide in the air. Under the effect of the dry climate, they could become also blue with a layer of blue copper sulfate. They could darken either, developing a layer of black copper sulfide. So within a few decades, bronze statues were not anymore what their creators intended them to be. And this inevitable new aspect explains probably the development of a new taste for artificial patination in the second and first century BC. Interest, oh, first of all, once again, the small bronze statuettes you can see here in the High Museum, and a kind, we try to propose you a reconstitution of the real colors, except that we don't know what of, what of which metal the attributes were made, so we didn't put them in the hands and on the hair of the mercury. This could be a possibility. Interest in artificial patination has increased indeed among scholars, and recent studies have shown that some bronzes, few bronzes, but some of them, were intentionally given a black patina by different methods. 
As a first method, some bronzes were given a black patina by application of sulfur to their surface, such as this little dwarf from the Magyar shipwreck. It is from the second century BC since the ship went under the ocean at the beginning of the first century BC. And here, the scholars discovered that the irises were made, were black, had a black patina. And this is this kind of patina with application of sulfur on the surface. Another example, which is kept in a in an American museum, the St. Louis Art Museum, which is said to have been found in the Fayum near Alexandria in Egypt. It is a child god or a child hero. It must be from the first century BC. And you can see that eyes and teeth are carved with sheets of, are covered with sheets of silver and that the statue has the statuette, for it is 62 centimeters high, the statuette has retained a black patina produced by the application of sulfide. This is a copper sulfide. So you see that this is another contrast with the silver eyes, silver teeth, and then the black surface of the body. So we can't be sure that the mercury, the small statuette, which echoes, echoed uh, the Discophorus, was echoing the Discophorus as it was at the time it was manufactured, or the Discophorus as it, as it was the, in the first century AD when the statuette was made. So maybe was it more brownish in color or more darker? The question is open to for the two statuettes which are from here in the High Museum, which belong to the Josephine's collection. This Mercury and the other one, which is a Hercules. This Mercury, which uh, was uh, found in Herculaneum, he was holding once more a caduceus in the right hand and a money bag in the left one, for he is represented as the protector of trade. We don't know if it was in a sanctuary or in a house, a private house. It could have been in a part of a profane decor. It could have adorned a garden as well. So maybe was it yellowish or more brownish or maybe blackened in color? The problem and the fact that we can't tell is that it was clean during the 18th century and a new patina, modern patina was added. So we can't have any clue, any details, any element telling about the first patina. The other statuette coming from Herculaneum is that one, a bronze representing Hercules with the club and the leonte, the lion skin, illustrating his first labor when he, defeat, he defeated the lion of Nemea. Hercules was very popular with the Romans and was represented in a number of different types, all derived from classical and Hellenistic Greek models. The Hercules could, belongs either to the Dexiomenos or the Bibex type. Dexiomenos from a Greek word meaning to outstretch or raise the right hand in greeting or prayer, and by extension to welcome and receive in a friendly way. Bibex for a lat from a Latin word meaning big drinker, to be completed with a vase in the hand. 
The only evidence of an intentional black patina, these are details, and you can see that um, here you have the eyes, like for the mercury, the eyes are silver inlaid. So maybe was it the same contrast with the white eyes and then the black patina, except that now we have another modern patina and we can't be sure. The only evidence for a, an intentional black patina in the Josephine's collection have survived on the foot of this lampstand, very unusual one. This lampstand is from Herculaneum and the restoration we have conducted last year has revealed the presence of a decoration of ivy leaves here on the foot, half inlaid with silver, half inlaid with a black patinated copper. And we are thinking, but we had no time to make analysis, that maybe this black ancient intentional patina was made with another way than the first one. Scholars discover since 15 years, are working since 15 years, on another way of patination. There was indeed another way to give a black patina to a bronze. But it was very special for the copper alloy had to be intentionally enriched with gold or silver. And because of the presence of these precious metals, the copper alloy could develop under a chemical attack a deep and durable black patina. It is accepted now that this recipe of black copper or black bronze is linked with what the Roman called Corinthian bronzes, so precious to them that they spent large amount, amount of money to acquire them. But to be identified, these black patinas have to be studied in research laboratory. And I show you one of these witness of such a patina. It is a small ink pot kept in the Louvre Museum from the first century AD. And you can see that it is adorned with different figures this is Venus, Aphrodite, Psyche, Adonis, and here the little putty playing uh, an, the, an action in theater, echoing the, how Adonis returned from a hunt and was wounded. And here this small Eros is just looking at the wound. And Adonis was going to die from this wound he was Venus lover, and here it could be Adonis at his graveyard. And here, look at these details. We could see our, with our eyes that at any time you had these lines of gold, these inlays of gold, these parts were in uh, zones which were black. And when we gave this input to the laboratory, the laboratory di discovered that it was real black copper with an, an intentional amount of gold and silver. And you can see how the patina is intact. It is deep dark and all around the other part of the input here it was another copper in alloy, and you can see that it has corrosion products. It now is green. It's brass, but now it's green. This is only the part which is still black, and here other inlays were silver, and we discovered that some others we can see now were copper, red copper, but the corrosion products are exactly the same 
as the corrosion products for the brass. And here is the aspect of the ink pot at the very beginning, so very different in color. So it is a very new research, but we have to keep in mind, we, that means the curators, the archaeologists, the conservators, and of course everyone who looks at the bronze, that they were very different as they are now, and that for us working in museums, we need to be very cautious when cleaning a bronze, and we have to be helped by people working in laboratory to be sure that there is a black ancient patina or not. So if you go back in the gallery to see the Josephine's collection, if you go back to see the, the small mercury from the royal French collections, just think how different they looked at the very beginning. Thank you. And of course, yes. if, you, if you have some questions, any question, if I can answer, of course, I'll do that. I'll be very happy to do that. Who owned the armor or provided the armor to the gladiators? Did they own it themselves or did somebody else make it for them? Oh, yes, somebody else made it for them, yeah. Who would that be? No, but they were workers. But we don't know. We don't have... We don't who paid for it? Uh, who? Who paid for the armor? It's oh, so fancy. rich Romans. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> because, you know, it was part of the, the entertainment. It's very important. And the emperor, of course, uh, each Roman emperor gave those feasts with large amount of different... Uh, um, fights in the Coliseum and that so there were many gladiators who were trained in order to fight for the pleasure of rich Romans and the pleasure was given for other Romans but there were Romans who paid of course for them. Uh, yes, I was just curious, do you have a working scale in terms of the percentage of copper and tin that will give you the different colors as an idea of the background for what they should look like? No. Well, I mean... Well, you in indicated that if it was 15% tin... Yes. ...that you got a really gold-like color, but what happens if you scale from 1 through 15 in terms of the percentage of yes, tin. Yes, but we, we, can, we can tell, we can know precisely, we can have samples, modern samples telling us this is the real color. Mostly we have 10% alloy, but sometimes you can have alloys added with uh, lead too, so the color is really different. But then, of course, we could do that for every single bronze, but we have to analyze them, and mostly we have no possibility to do so. So we can't tell which is, if you don't make analysis, you can tell precisely which was the real color. But um, a very important question is to remember that even if you know the bronze was more reddish or more yellowish, you don't have to clean it till you rediscover the, the, the genuine color because you go under the surface and there are some uh, people who do that already now in some, in some countries, uh, Central Europe, for instance. And it's a, it's a pity because they ruin bronzes. They just excavate and the year after in exhibitions, the bronze are yellow, which is awful. So, but of course, it's better to keep them green and to try by samples to tell people how they were. If I answered your question, I don't know. Was it? Yeah? Well, if there are no more questions, I think... Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. I'd like to know what chemicals you use to clean the bronze when you do it or when your team does it, and what other chemicals are being used in Central <laughs> Europe. What is the difference between the two chemicals well, used? 
usually we don't use now chemical methods. We don't. It's very smooth. They just do that under uh, microscopes and with, well, some little knives or little smooth things very cautiously. It takes very long. If you use a, me a chemical method, in within a few minutes, you can just uh, change the color of your bronze. So what? So it's very easy, but it's very, well, it's a kind of a tragedy for a bronze. And this happened a long time ago, well, during the 19th century. Uh, the German, who were very brilliant chemists, thought it was the way to do so. So most bronzes now kept in Berlin, for instance, were chemically cleaned. And you can see that they have holes, pits. They're very, they're yellow or brown. brown. Uh, it happened to the Greek bronzes in Olympia because the German who were the, the main excavators uh, during the, at the end of the 19th century and then 20th century just cleaned them like that. So they have a, a special color which is not the color they had at the very beginning, no, not the color they should have now if they had retained their natural corrosion products. I know that many ancient uh, marble statues we know today were painted in colors. Did they yes. ever paint bronzes on top of? This is, this is a very interesting question. There are very few bronzes for which we can tell that they were painted. There is only one small Medusa's head kept in Berlin and uh, the conservators, well, it was, since, uh, at the, at the end of the 19th century, the curator tell, told and wrote, Ford Wengler wrote, I can see color on the tongue, it was red, the eyes are white, and this little piece was analyzed, and it was really painted with a special red color. So it is one witness, but it's very difficult, but we have to trace, we have to try to find those. Because when you look at Greek vases, when you look at warriors, the way the helmets are, or, or the shields are decorated, you can see designs, patterns, but where are they? When you have the helmets in the collection, there are no more patterns, no more designs. So where are they painted? So we have to be very cautious. But Actually, at the moment, we I know only one bronze which retain a painted addition. But there were, maybe. We have to find, we have to work. All of us, I mean, working on ancient bronzes. And we have time for one more question. Oh. I'm surprised at how elaborate the armor is and some of the other items. Do you think that was normal? What, what was normal? That the, how elaborate the armor, particularly the helmet of the gladiator was. Do you think that that was normal, or that was that one exceptional? I know. Yes, the, very very elaborate. Yes. It was normal. Really. Yeah, we think so because all of them, all of them are like that, but they were intended to be, well, for parade. But then. We thought they were only for parade, but no, they were worn by the war by the gladiators. Yes, they were. Yes. So they were shining, they were bright. Thank you everyone for coming. We look forward to having you next Saturday. And thank you, Sophie Decamp. It's a pleasure. <laughs>